Welcome to ENG 303, study session one, grammar, introduction. Grammar is a term which has different interpretations. It may be considered from the perspective of language usage or analysis. It may dwell on the different forms that a language takes as written or spoken, or it may be from the different perspectives from which different theories look at it. The fact of the matter is that the term grammar is capable of different interpretations. In this lecture, we shall look at these different views and identify the course we shall pursue in this book. Objectives. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to, one, explain the concept grammar. Two, distinguish different senses of grammar, identify types of grammar, and associate different grammars with specific grammatical orientations. Pretest. One, what is grammar? Two, what types of grammar do you know? Three, what is the essence of grammar in discussions on language? Content. Grammar is a very popular term among students and scholars of language or linguistics. When a person speaks in an elevated style or when he is bombastic, he may be said to be speaking grammar, especially when he is speaking a foreign language, such as English, which people to learn. A person who also understands the rule of a language can be said to understand grammar. And people become the more confused when there are talks of a grammar book or a grammar school. In this lecture, we shall expose the different strands and locate the definition of grammar which we shall adopt in this book. Definitions of grammar. The term grammar can be defined from different perspectives. One, it is the quality of linguistic knowledge that an individual language user possesses. This knowledge is innate. This is because every normal person is born with the ability to speak a particular language. In addition, individuals, especially toddlers, do not go to school to learn their mother tongues before they start speaking their indigenous languages. It is this knowledge that non-literate members of the society have which enables them to judge whether a person has spoken the language well or not. It is through this innate linguistic knowledge that they could mark foreigners apart from indigenous, for example, native versus non-native speakers of a particular language. Two, grammar is the body of descriptive statements about a particular language. Such descriptions state what rules a language user must follow if he wants to produce acceptable expressions. For instance, in English, there are rules for forming plurals of nouns rules for forming past tenses of verbs, rules of concord, and so on. For instance, the following expressions violate different rules of English. A. Informations are provided. B. He goes to school yesterday. C. Boys play pranks. The first sentence violates plural rule, which does not allow certain words such as furniture, aircraft, cattle, faith, and so on. To carry the plural affix s, the second sentence is wrong because the verb go has a separate mechanism for changing the present form to the past. And the third sentence violates one of the central of rules, subject verb concord, the rule which stipulates that a subject and its verb must agree in person and number. Thus, 
The sentences should be respectively written as A. Information is provided. B. He went to school yesterday. C. Boys play pranks. 3. Grammar is the prescriptive statement about the structure of a language. In this sense, a group of knowledgeable users of the language adjudicate as to what is grammatical and what is not. They dictate what is elegant in language usage and encourage language users to follow their guidelines in using elegant language forms. Such descriptions dictate the choice between it is I and it is me. A ready example of such bodies is the French Academy, which ensures that French is standardized but not bastardized. 4. Finally, grammar could also be defined as a book that contains these descriptions, rules, and structural pertaining of a language. Such books, therefore, serve as guides for language learners and users. In this course, both the definitions of grammar as the innate quality of language and individual processes as a descriptive statement about the workings of a language are relevant. This shall be adopted in the course of this lecture. Two, types of grammar. There are also different types of grammar. These are one, diachronic grammar. This is a grammar which traces the history of a language. It may trace the etymology of a word or the behavior of a particular linguistic element, providing relevant information on the different forms it takes at each stage before it arrives at the form it currently features. An example is a definite article, say. In Old English, it had a form B. In Middle English, the form was seal. And in Modern English, the form is the. Two, synchronic grammar. In this type of grammar, we focus on a specific period in the usage of a particular language and describe the linguistic features that were in use then. For instance, we might choose to discuss the syntax of Shakespearean English, the reduction of inflections or great vowel shift, or front whom loud of the Middle English, or any form in any other period. What matters is that we are describing the features of a language at a particular period. This is a synchronic grammar. Three, contrastive grammar. This type of grammar deals with the comparison of structures in different languages. This is usually done with a view to identifying the areas of similarities which facilitate learning and areas of differences which in the learning and on which teachers have to do extra work in teaching the foreign language to students. Four, pedagogical grammar. In this grammar, language skills and usage patterns that are considered acceptable and elegant in a society are taught. The teacher makes the student differentiate between formal and colloquial expressions between language and dialect and between high and low varieties of a language. In this course, we shall be dealing with the synchronic type of grammar. Since this book is directed at learners and budding linguists, we have also included aspect of pedagogy. Hence, features of both description and teaching are incorporated in this course. Adequacy of grammar. The major business that linguists have with the study of language is to provide explanations of the grammar of a language based on their observations on the adequacy of grammar. 
The attempt is to present an account of the language that is acceptable to the native speakers of the language. This is in accordance to the ideas of 1965, 4 to 5, that a fully adequate grammar must assign to each of an infinite range of sentences a structural description indicating how this sentence is understood by the ideal speaker, hearer. To achieve this goal, linguistics use the criteria of adequacy as enunciated by Akhmajian and Henry, 1975-84. According to them, the grammar of a language must, one, produce all the sentences of that language, two, produce no ill-formed strings, three, express the linguistical significant generalizations about that language. In this vein, Linguists view the adequacy of grammar in three ways. These are 1. Observational adequacy. In observational adequacy, scholars study the data of a language collected from native and proficient speakers of the language. In some cases, linguists who are native speakers of the language may generate data by introspections or by collective performance, including the linguist. The linguist thus analyzes the data. Based on some recurring features, he may detect general rules from the data. Such rules form the basis of the linguistics proclamation about the grammar of the language. Thus, a grammar is observationally adequate if it can distinguish between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences. Two, descriptive adequacy. A grammar is peculiar to a language. In other words, each language has a set of rules that guide the construction of grammatical sentences. For such grammar to be functional, it must be descriptively adequate. This means that it must specify an infinite number of sentences which the native speaker of the language can judge as grammatical as well as the relationship between them. It follows that the descriptively adequate grammar must conform to the native speaker's intuition about the language and the user's ability in its usage. Thus, the linguistic extract the grammar from the language user's competence in the language. Three, explanatory adequacy. In cases where two different grammars of a language are both observationally and descriptively adequate, the linguists are to resort to a distinction between hard hoc rules and universal grammatical rules to choose a better grammar. Hard hoc grammars are usually constructed to satisfy a particular need in a construction. Therefore, they are useless for pedagogical purposes. Universal grammatical rules, on the other hand, apply to all languages. Thus, the scholar will prefer universal grammar rules which support pedagogy to ad hoc rules which are limited in application. Explanatorily adequate grammars state the facts of different languages in terms of universal grammar and therefore facilitate the preparation of a facilitate the preparation of pedagogical grammar. Therefore, an explanatorily adequate grammar correctly chooses the preferred grammar over less satisfactory alternatives in every case. If a language satisfies the foregoing levels of adequacy, its grammar is regarded as adequate. However, no language has yet been reported to have reached this point of adequacy. Hence, each language is still being studied to achieve the three levels of adequacy. 
Summary In this lecture, you have learned that the different definitions of grammar and the different types of grammar. You also learned the three levels of adequacy on which a grammar is tested. We have come to the end of session one. Thanks for listening.